Welcome to note set number 36, where we'll be talking about a tool for continuous time systems called Bode plots. Uh, we've just been looking at those. In note set number 35, um, what we were looking at, those frequency response plots, really are Bode plots. Um, but what we're going to do here is learn how to look at a frequency or look at a transfer function and very easily come up with a rough sketch of what the uh, frequency response is going to look like. Um, that is invaluable uh, a s skill to have. Um, yeah, you can you know take the circuit, put it into um, you know, P-spice and it'll give you this beautiful uh, frequency response plot, but um, if you don't understand how to do Bode plots by hand, you'll never be able to um, really make any decisions about, gee, my circuit's not working exactly how I want, um, how can I fix it? Um, by knowing about Bode plots, you'll have great insight into doing that. So fundamentally, a Bode plot is just what we've been plotting. Uh, plot frequency response in dB on a log frequency axis. Uh, and technically they would also include phase plots, but we're only going to focus on the magnitude part here. Uh, so like I said, we can easily use freak S um, or um, you know, P-spice or any kind of numerical method to get these beautiful Bode plots. Um, but what you don't gain by doing that is an insight into um, what about the transfer function makes it swoop or peak in that particular way. And if I don't have that swoop or peak that I want, what do I have to change to get it? You could sit there all day trying different structures in P-Spice and never get what you want. But if you know, ah, this is the kind of structure that makes that swoop, then you can put it in and you got it. Um, so if you want to be a, a circuit designer, or a system analyst, system designer, um, this is the way to do it. So we're going to sneak up on this. We're going to have to go slog through a little bit of math first, but uh, once we get through all this, the actual process is really quite simple and straightforward. Um, so, you know, let's suppose we've got some sort of frequency response that came from a transfer function, um, and so we, we factored that transfer function uh, h of s. Um, into uh, a bunch of factors up here and a bunch of factors down here uh, and then we replace s by um, j omega and so here's one of those factors here's another factor uh, here's one in the denominator another one in the denominator and um, we may also have some complex poles and zeros and so if we do we would keep those together in a um, s squared s um, plus constant term. Uh, so suppose we have something that looks like that. And we're taking the magnitude, so we have the magnitude of every term. Um, now we're going to convert to dB, and uh, if you remember the log of a uh, product of two things is the sum of their two individual logs, and the log of a um, quotient of two things is the difference of those two logs. Um, so um, we've got a lot of products and quotients going on here. So when we take the log of this whole thing, what we get is um, all the numerator terms end up giving us positive log terms that all just add together. So each one of those things that I have circled um, is just one of these terms after it's been, uh, after we've taken the log of it. Uh, and then all the things in the denominator have negatives in front of them. Um, so um, what we see here is the you know a real characteristic of taking things into logarithm form into dB form is that each term that contributes to the frequency response, each one of these factors, um, so each factor that gives us a pole or a zero. Um, or a complex pair of poles or a complex pair of zeros um, can be thought of as making a contribution in dB and then all of those individual contributions just add together to give us the total contribution. So it's this adding together that makes it very easy for us to deal with this. Um, so that just summarizes the, the things that I just said. 
Um, so we're going to do one little trick first before we get into actually doing what it is that we want. <clears throat> so remember I said we, we really think about starting from H of S here. And one of the tricks that we're going to do is um, we're going to go through and take if there's any number out in front uh, and if there's you know each term that comes from uh, a first order factor uh, and then each term from a second order factor will take the constant so we take all the constants we take all the constants in the denominator and we're going to factor all those things out so if we do that algebraically uh, we'd get this 2, the 10, and the 40,000 all pulled out in front and grouped with the K we'd have the 5, the 20, and the 6,400 all grouped out here down in the denominator and so we've got this thing out in front which we will refer to as our gain term um, but let's see what is left behind after we've pulled these things out, right? So let's just look at the s plus 2. We pull out the 2 and we're left with a 1. We pull out a 2 out of here and we're left with an s over 2, okay? Uh, pull the 10 out, we have an s over 10 plus 1 and so on. We pull the 40,000 out, we have an s over 200 squared. That's because 200 squared is equal to 40,000, okay? Uh, and here we leave the 40,000 um, explicit. We just, we do the, the, the trick here just so that we can put it inside the square. So, um, so that's the trick that we're going to do, and the reason that we do that is to just make it into a form that makes it a little easier to work with. Then when we replace our J omegas, um, you know, the S gets replaced by J omega, S gets replaced by J omega, S gets replaced by J omega, and, and so on. Now the whole point of doing all of this is that then when we take the DB form of this and we get each one of those terms that adds or subtracts, every single one of them um, will be um, 0 DB at, at the low frequencies um, with, with, the accept, with the exception of uh, a sole S or any power of a soul s out in front, whether it be in the numerator or the denominator. Um, but all these other terms, first and second order terms, will be um, 0 dB down at the low frequencies. So what that means is um, until they start to do something else, we can pretty much ignore them. They're, they're not even there because they're adding 0 dB to everything else. And this trick allows us to sequentially worry about the poles and zeros starting from the low um, valued poles and zeros and moving towards the higher valued poles and zeros. Now that'll make sense when we go through an example. But let's look at what each one of these different terms looks like. So we've got the 20 log 10 of some big constant out in front. I'm showing it just as k, but it, you know, it could have all those other terms out in front. So um, that would be our, our gain term out in front. So even though we're taking 20 log 10 of something, it's you know 20 log 10 of a constant is a constant. So that's just a flat plot, just flat versus omega. Okay, so we don't have to worry about that. If we've got um, an s to the n power or an s um, to the minus n power down in the numerator. Um, so n could be uh, an integer that's positive or negative. Um, then we're going to have um, it either going up or going down. Now notice this thing never changes. It's just constantly going up or constantly going down. Um, and, and the slope is going to be plus or minus n times 20 dB. Um, so uh, when I have um, uh, my plot is being shown for n equal to 2, the slope of this is minus 40 dB, the slope of this is plus 40 dB. So um, we're just going through these individual terms and then we'll see how it all fits together. So each one of the terms that's just a first order factor, um, whether it's in the numerator or denominator, will determine whether it ends up with plus or minus 20 out in front. Um, and what ends up happening here, we, we, the blue and the red curves show the, the actual plot, but what we see is that we can approximate that um, with just two straight lines, one going flat, and then we either go up by plus 20 dB per decade or down by negative 20 dB per decade. And when do we make that change? Um, that change happens right at the breakpoint. So in this case, um, this is the breakpoint 
omega equal to a. Um, so that's nice. Uh, and then we have a second order term, and, and again, we can, we can draw them, or we can make nice, pretty plots of them, but we see that, um, again, we can approximate it as a straight line, um, and then a um, it br either breaks up or breaks down, uh, depending upon whether it's in the numerator or the denominator, and where does it break? It breaks at omega equal to omega sub n. Uh, so we find that omega sub n value, um, and uh, that's where the breakpoint is going to happen. Hey, remember we saw that when we looked at second order first and low, or second order low pass and high pass filters? Yeah. Uh, and when we looked at a first order low pass filter, it looked like this, 20 dB per decade. When we looked at a second order low pass filter, it looked like this, um, with 40 dB per decade. That's what we're seeing here. So each of these terms corresponds to um, the same kinds of simple things that we've seen. But more complex circuits is will have many of these things all working together. And we've now seen that all we have to do is, after we've taken them in dB uh, they are, and done that little trick, they can all just be added together uh, very simply. So um, what we're going to do is just um, start below all these so-called breakpoints, and I'll explain how we find these breakpoints um, in general. And if we stop, if we start plotting low enough, um, all of those terms will be at zero dB, and we only have to worry about the constant term uh, and any uh, poles or zeros at the origin. Uh, and then as we move up in frequency, um, we'll encounter each breakpoint and that will change the amount of slope that we have. And then we use the fact that um, since we're adding in a line with a slope, maybe to something that already has a slope, if we add two lines together, um, we get a new line whose slope is equal to the sum of the slopes. So all this makes it very easy to do this. So here's the steps that we're going to go through. I'm, I'm not going to read through them on this chart. This chart is just a nice place for you to have it all in one, um, one sheet for you to follow, for you to do it yourself. Um, but what I will do is lead you through an example. So suppose this is our transfer function. Maybe we've analyzed a circuit and we've found this. And we want to know um, what this uh, frequency response of this thing looks like on a dB log plot. So the first thing we do um, is, is factor this thing. So um, we see that we have uh, to the third, to the second, to the first, so we can pull an S out in front. Um, so that's the, the, the first step that we've done. Then the next thing that we're going to do is we can use MATLAB to find the roots of this, and we find the roots of this numerator here um, are actually two distinct real roots. Uh, the denominator, though, we find out that we have a, um, a quadratic term that has uh, complex roots. So we're going to leave those together. We would have to, by hand, combine those back together into uh, a single quadratic term. And then we have one other uh, real root. So once we do all of that, we uh, have something that looks like this. So this is what we get uh, as a result of taking two terms with these roots and smashing them back together. Um, and that's not too hard. It's tedious, but not hard. Um, and we notice that, it, you know, in this second order term, we need to write it in our standard form with uh, natural frequency and damping um, factor zeta. Uh, and so here, here's how we then um, parcel out each of those individual um, values. So we look at this and we say 100 is equal to omega sub n squared, therefore omega sub n is 10. Then we say 2 is equal to 2 zeta omega sub n. So 2 zeta omega sub n is equal to 2. Um, the 2's cancel, so zeta omega sub n is equal to uh, 1. And since omega sub n is equal to 10, zeta is equal to 0.1. So we can quickly figure out what omega sub n is, we can figure out what zeta is, and we only have to do that for uh, quadratic terms for which we have complex 
roots. Notice that this quadratic term we've broken into its real root factors. Okay, good. So the next step, convert to uh, the J omega form. Now you may actually find it more convenient to do step three, pulling out the factors uh, or, or pulling out the constant terms when it's in its S form, but it, it you can do it either either place. It doesn't really matter. So we just replace S by J omega. And then the next step is pull out the constants. So we've got our 50, we've got our 200, we've got our two, uh, and then for any quadratic term that's left, remember we're pulling out the constant here, uh, 100. So those are our constants. We're going to pull those out in front. So there they are, uh, the 50, the 200, the 2, the 100, combined with the 0.1 that was out in front. Um, multiply and divide those out, and you get a gain term of 5. So set that off to the side. And notice that over here, uh, we now have our J omega over 50, J omega over 200, J omega over 2. Um, so the, the reality is, once you get good at this, you don't really need to do all these steps explicitly. What we're mostly interested in is finding out what the gain term is and finding out what the zeta and omega n is for any quadratic term, and then finding out what the breakpoints are, 50, 200, 2, um, and um, omega sub n of 10. So we always have to take the square root of that. Um, so we combine uh, the j omega term with the, with the gain term. So that'll be one thing that we'll, we'll deal with those together. Identify the breakpoints and list them in ascending order. Um, so here, here we go. Uh, we've got a, a 2 in the denominator, a 10 in the denominator, a 50, and a 200. That's the order, and we list them there, and we tag them with what effect they're going to have on the slope, the change in slope. So when I hit this breakpoint for this term, well, let me back up. The thing that we've learned so far is that if we go far enough down below 2, all of these things are flat. They're just flat, and then they're eventually going to either break upwards or break downwards. But down below 2, they're flat at 0 dB. That's the whole point of doing uh, that gain grouping out in front. Um, but once we do hit 2, what effect does this have? Well, we break, and since it's in the denominator, we break downwards. So um, the change in slope that that term is going to contribute is minus 20 dB per decade. Um, and that's because it's a first order denominator term. Then our next one is 10. That comes from a denominator term that is a quadratic term. So at 10, we're going to experience a change in slope of minus 40 dB per decade. 40 because second order, minus because denominator. Then 50 is our next. So that'll be plus 20 dB. 20 because first order, plus because numerator. And then finally, 200 will give us a change of plus 20 dB per decade. 20 because first order, plus because in numerator. So we now have our little table that tells us how to deal with our breakpoints. OK, let's charge on here. Um, so the next thing we do is we identify any j omega terms. Um, it could be in the numerator, it could be in the denominator. And we're going to evaluate that in dB at some omega value, doesn't matter where, just pick a convenient one, but it has to be at least one decade below the lowest breakpoint. So here our lowest breakpoint was 2, so one decade below it, that would be 0 0.2. And so we're going to go to point 0.1 just because that's a place where um, our log blocks um, go at powers of 10, right? So point 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and, and so on. <clears throat> OK, so, um, so let's evaluate this term in dB at omega equal to point 0.1. So when we do that, we have 20 log 10 of point 0.5 minus 6 dB. So we're going to start our plot at omega equal to 0.1 minus 6 dB. That's where our plot starts. And because this is corresponding to a term that is a single j omega 
in the numerator. Single, it'll have a slope of plus 20 dB. If we started with an S squared out alone by itself, we would have 20, or I'm sorry, 40 dB. Um, and since it's in the numerator, it's going to be plus. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start at minus 6 dB at point 1, and we're going to start with a slope of plus 20 dB per decade and move up from there until we hit our first breakpoint, and then we're going to have to change our slope based upon what that first breakpoint does to us. So here is what we um, have as our table. So at each of those breakpoints, we'll, we'll um, see what happens with the change. And then finally, since we do have a second order um, uh, complex uh, pair of poles, uh, we should make an adjustment for um, underdamped scenarios. Now I know that underdamped is technically uh, when zeta is less than 1, but um, you can see that um, when zeta is 0.5, we don't have to make much of an adjustment at all. Um, but when we're down, uh, so you know, for for like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, the adjustment's even smaller. So I typically ignore it. Um, so for our case, we had zeta equal to 0.1. So we're going to have a resonant peak that bumps up 14 dB. So let's put all of this together. Um, so I've got our breakpoints listed here in red. Um, we're starting all the way down at point 0.1 and plotting that 5j omega term that was up in the numerator. So we're going to start, um, remember we said we started at um, minus 6 dB, so there it is. We put a point at minus 6 dB, um, and then we draw a line um, that goes up one decade, so up one decade is to 1, and up 20, deg uh, 20 dB from there, we put a point there and we draw a line. And we draw that line all the way up to the next breakpoint. Now at that next breakpoint, remember, we had um, something in the denominator. So that denominator causes a change of slope of minus 20 dB. So we have a slope of plus 20. Now the slope's going to change by minus 20. So our slope is going to be 0 dB per decade um, here. So that's the combination of slopes of this going up and one going down by minus 20, uh, which makes us level off. Uh, and we draw that over to our next breakpoint. Now 10, remember, um, was a uh, quadratic term in the denominator. And so um, that's going to cause us to go uh, change by minus 40 dB. So we were at 0 dB. We're changing by negative 40. So our new slope is going to be negative 40. Um, and this is because it's a second order term. So now we go up a decade. So we were at 10. We go up to 100 and go down 40. And we draw a little point there. And then, um, so there's our point. And then we draw our line. But we only draw it up to our next breakpoint. We went to 100 because that's the easy thing to do for to measure 40 dB per decade. Um, but then when we draw it, we stop at our breakpoint. If our breakpoint, if if 50 were instead say at like you know, you know, 200 or 300, then we would continue drawing past 100. So now we're at our breakpoint of 50, which was in the numerator. Uh, it was a first order term in the numerator. Um, was it in the numerator? I need to back up and see. I thought it was in the numerator. Ah, yes, it was in the numerator. Um, so uh, it's in the numerator, so it gives us a plus 20 dB of change. Yeah, OK, so we're right here. It gives us a plus 20 dB of change, so we were at minus 40. Plus 20 changes us um, to minus 20. So we're going to have a slope now of minus 20. So we go up a decade, down 20 put a, uh, a dot there, draw a line, truncate it at our next breakpoint. And then at 200, 200 was also in the numerator, so that's going to give us an additional plus 20 dB. So we're at minus 20, and we're going to get another 20, so we're going to be at 0 dB um, slope. And so now, and we have no other breakpoints, so we just draw 
straight over as far as um, our axis shows. Um, so that's our straight line approximation to the Bode plot. And then the last thing we have to do is adjust because we had a, a, an, a highly underdamped uh, quadratic term. So remember, 10 was our natural frequency for that. Uh, zeta was equal to 0 0.1, which we found out gave us a 14 dB correction. So we come back over here um, and we adjust for the zeta equal to 0.1 by going up 14 dB. And then we by hand kind of draw a, um, a, a little resonant curve. Uh, a little resonant peak. You know, how, how narrow do you make it? I mean, you're just roughly approximating here. Um, and so that's how you, you build these things. And so there is the exact one made by MATLAB, uh, and uh, there's my approximate. Um, so it's, it's not exact, um, it's approximate. But it's very quick and dirty. But the most important thing is you know why you have each and every one of these behaviors. You know what part of your transfer function gave you that. And if you were saying, gee, actually, I, I didn't want this to happen, um, you know why this is happening, and you know what to remove or change to make that do something different. And that's the power of this. So hopefully you can uh, do some practice on these. We'll do some in class. Um, and uh, they're an excellent skill to have. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video.